you don't you don't see Quebec doing this week. That's why I say we can learn from the province of Quebec and, and the people of Quebec. They don't trash their own projects. Former Premier Danny Williams takes the stand. And he's standing by Muskrat Falls. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Danny Williams is not backing down on Muskrat Falls. The former premier spent today defending the project at the ongoing inquiry. It was the first of his two days of testimony. Here now is Katie Breen was there for it, listening in. Katie, what did you take away from the hearing today? Well, I learned today that Danny Williams, according to him, Muskrat Falls is still worth it, even at $4.7 billion over budget. He's confident about that and about government's role in the lead up to sanctioning. At the inquiry today, the co-counsel questioned Williams on whether Muskrat was his legacy project, whether he ignored opposing opinions and went ahead with it on ego. Williams is vocal with his hatred for Hydro-Quebec and the Upper Churchill deal. Critics have questioned if NACOR had the depth to build a hydro dam, given most of the corporation's experience was in oil and gas. I didn't need a Churchill project to put my stamp on, on, on the province, sir, and nor did I, nor did I care. I went in and did what I wanted to do to the best of my ability in conjunction with the best advice and the best team I could put together. And I did it in the best interest of the people of this province. So for some people, I try to be respectful here, but for some people to come around and try and disparage the project and disparage us and, you know, merely make a fool of Newfoundland and Labrador. At that, the commissioner challenged Williams. He said that as an elected official in a democracy, people have a right to disagree. Williams said that in a democratic society, he has the right to tackle his critics and fire back. Of course, one big criticism of the project is the associated power bills. Today, Williams guaranteed rates wouldn't double when the project came online and said families shouldn't worry. He says it's always been NACOR's plan to use non-renewable resources to help pay for renewable resources. This scenario about using oil and gas revenues to subsidize rates, for example, was not communicated to the public. That was, that was part of the whole NACOR concept. They, that in, in the energy plan, that was the, that was the concept. That's how it was going to work. Williams will be back testifying at the hearing again tomorrow. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. And Here and Now, we'll come back to this story and bring you more of former Premier Danny Williams' testimony in about 30 minutes. A company in Labrador West wants to get an iron ore project off the ground, but to do so, it needs a billion dollars. I'll give you the latest on Alderaan's Kami project coming up on Here and Now. Well, pressure is mounting on DJ Composites, the employer feuding with Unifor in Gander. Today, the union got its meeting with Premier Dwight Ball. The Premier says he will be calling the company and asking them to get back to the bargaining table. He met with union officials today to discuss the dispute. He says he'll give the company 48 hours to respond. For me, I'm thinking about the members in Gander. I'm thinking about 651 days. And I just uh, want to get everyone back to work and doing what they do. Uh, they do a great job up in Gander, doing what they do. I've, done, I've been doing that for many years. So my job here, working with John and and members of the uh, members of our departments here to get people back at the table where we believe there can be a, a, a suitable settlement that will reflect you know what should happen at successful negotiating tables so for reaction from the union side we're heading to the picket line in gander here and now's garrett berry is live once again tonight so garrett we've heard from the premier what is the union saying well, union leaders are actually just right now going to the picketers around the uh, picket site here and letting them know about the events of today. So uh, union, you know, the union members, rank and file, are still kind of learning of the events. But we have heard from Unifor's national president, and uh, he was one of the union officials in town, in St. John's rather, to meet with the premier. And much like he did last week, he's putting a lot of pressure to at the government, saying it's time for government to intervene. And he says that phone call that Dwight Ball is promising is a start, but not enough. We are absolutely pushing him to do, uh, to reconvene the House uh, within a week and then pass legislation that talks about binding arbitration if, in fact, the company's not going to uh, come to the bargaining table. On the picket line today, union activists waited for news from the meeting. This company, they're 
they just are hard to deal with and, and it's been unbelievable. So I'm hoping that once they sit down with him and sees that, yes, I'm, I'm hoping that binding arbitration is, decides that for us. Oh, well, they have a majority Liberal government. They can pretty well do what they want. So if they really want to, they can, they can assert their power and do this, yeah. This is day six of Uniform's blockade. They still say they're not going anywhere. So we've had some people go home. As anybody's tried to get a flight in or out of Gander lately, uh, we had some people go home, but we had fresh new recruitments coming in this morning, so nothing, it's, we're unwavered. But there's also a somber mood. The union is paying tribute to one of their own, who died suddenly on Friday. We are all family here, so they, they suffered a great loss, but so did we as far as a union, because she was uh, so supportive. They were the first ones on the line uh, when we arrived in Gander, and she was here every day. So it's, it's, very, it's a very sad time, for sure. Well, tomorrow this fight moves back from St. John's into Gander, and more specifically into Supreme Court here in Gander. DJ Confesis has gone to court and is seeking an order from a judge to get the blockade that you see behind me shut down. Now, for Unifor's part, the union says this issue and this fight isn't going to be resolved in a courthouse. It's going to take binding arbitration. And no matter what, the union says, despite whatever the judge may rule, the uniform presence here in Gander is not going to end tomorrow. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Garrick Berry in Gander. 50 people working here when the plant opened since September 1999. Later on Here and Now, we're going to look back at the history of DJ Composites and bring you some of our coverage of the company yes, over the years. Canada reached an agreement in principle with the United States and Mexico on a modernized and updated North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA gets a name change to the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Canada made some concessions on daily dairy supply management. Hefty tariffs imposed by the U.S. on steel and aluminum will also remain intact for now. But Ottawa saved a dispute resolution mechanism. It also won assurances for the auto industry. The agreement must still be ratified by all three countries. The Prime Minister credits Canada's tough negotiating stance for the new trade deal. We have all been through moments uh, over the course of these negotiations where we felt very close only to see it uh, not end up working out. So I think we were all very mindful that there was a definite window uh, now, uh, where the, uh, the uh, midnight deadline by the United States to send the text to Congress uh, was a very real deadline that gave us an opportunity to work towards it. Donald Trump is framing the deal as a huge win for the United States. He says it wouldn't have happened without him and his use of tariffs. By the way, without tariffs, we wouldn't be talking about a deal. Just for those babies out there that keep talking about tariffs. That includes Congress. Oh, please don't charge tariffs. Without tariffs, you wouldn't be, we wouldn't be standing here. We'll get details and the political reaction a little later on Here and Now when we speak live with Parliament Hill reporter Catherine Cullen. Well, despite a major setback, Fish NL leader Ryan Cleary says he's not ready to give up. On Friday, Fish NL's union certification was rejected by the province's Labor Relations Board. It said the would-be union fell short of having enough members to warrant a vote. It marks the end of a two-year struggle filled with fiery protests outside FFAW offices and years of contentious arguments between both sides. But Ryan Cleary says while his group may have lost the battle, it hasn't lost the war. Now that he knows how many Fish NL members are needed, Ryan says he's ready to resume recruiting. A woman who crashed a car into a St. John sports complex has been charged with making a false police report. The 26-year-old was taken to hospital after crashing into the Newfoundland and Labrador Sports Centre on Crosby Road. She's now in police custody. It all started overnight Saturday when police responded to a call that a woman had been stabbed. 
Officers went to a home on Canada Drive but couldn't find a victim. From there, police spotted a Ford Focus fleeing the area at high speed. Moments later, the driver crashed. Any witnesses to the incident are asked to contact the RNC or Crime Stoppers. Alderaan's recent feasibility study of its Cami Mines project paints a pretty picture. The iron ore company put the project on hold back in 2014, but now Alderaan says China's push for cleaner air means the Labrador West product is more in demand. Jacob Barker has more. Some interest, but no one is actually rushing to write checks. This isn't the first time Alderaan has been in Labrador West touting optimism for the Cami project. In a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, the company's CEO made clear the company's priority. I'd be happy to take questions, and I'd be happy to take checks as well if you're willing to write them. <laughs> Alderaan needs nearly a billion dollars in financing to get the project started. It's a process that's going to require a lot of elbow grease and a lot of determination, but uh, I believe now is the time to do it. A recent feasibility study paints a rosy picture, billions in economic benefits, and thousands of hours of employment. About $5.1 billion to provincial and federal government revenues, about a $21.3 billion contribution to the national GDP, and more importantly, more than 100,000 person years of employment. The project was put on hold in 2014 when iron ore prices were bottoming out, but it was taken off the shelf last year when those prices started turning around. Now Eldum says China's appetite for high-grade ore is driving demand to the Labrador trough for a premium product. The market has changed and, and the reason for that is really China's drive to clean up their air pollution. The company says the project is still shovel ready, but an agreement with the Iron Ore Company of Canada to use its rail line to get the product into port in northern Quebec still has to be made and NL Hydro would have to make good on an agreement to provide the 65 megawatts of power needed to operate the mine. If you look at Labrador West with the industry and the towns, um, there isn't sufficient power. Uh, for um, for a newcomer like us, especially if Wabash Mines were to restart. We've committed uh, as a government and the Premier committed while he was here today, uh, the last couple of days. If Alderaan decides that they want this project to go, they will have the power. Well, a billion dollars is a tall order, but if it can get the financing it needs, Alderaan hopes to have shovels in the ground by 2020. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Labrador. Brad Guzhu picked up his 11th Grand Slam of Curling Championship yesterday in southwestern Ontario. Last rock, eighth end for the win. Guzhu was leading in the last end and had the hammer against Winnipeg's Reed Carruthers. He knocked out Winnipeg's rock to blank the end and close out the game, earning his second Elite 10 title. The championship was held in Chatham-Kent and opens up this year's curling season. What's your favorite food to eat? Strawberries, because they're sweet but not too sweet. Pizza? <laughs> Chicken souvlaki. Well, sadly, no pizza or souvlaki on the menu today. Kicking off Kids Eat Smart, that's coming up.
Land and Sea returns with a brand new season, beginning Sunday, October 14th. That's at noon on the island, 1130 in most of Labrador. Tune in to the St. John's Morning Show with Chrissy Holmes and Fred Hutton. Weekday mornings from 5.30 to 9. And welcome back to Here and Now. Well, after more than a year of diplomacy and some downright testy exchanges, Canada has reached an agreement with the U.S. to replace NAFTA. Ottawa and Washington came to terms last night, just hours before a deadline set by President Donald Trump was to expire. It's a weighty agreement with many chapters and much fine print. Catherine Cullen is in Ottawa trying to parse the details. So Catherine, what's in and what's out? Well, Debbie, it is a big, complicated deal, as you just said. But let's talk about some of the big things that come out of this. And in fact, one of the biggest issues has to do with what a lot of folks may have on their dinner table tonight, Canadian agricultural products, specifically the supply managed sector. So we're talking about dairy, we're talking about eggs, poultry. That has been a big issue. Anyone who's been following these NAFTA negotiations knows that Donald Trump had a real bee in his bonnet about Canada's dairy sector. He went on and on about how unhappy he, he felt uh, he was about that, how protectionist it was. And Canada did ultimately agree to give a little bit more market access to the United States. And that does have some agricultural producers, particularly dairy farmers, concerned. They say, well, in and of itself, this one particular move may not be the end of Canada's dairy market, they're concerned that this is part of death by a thousand cuts. Now, important to consider as they say this, that the Canadian government is getting prepared to compensate them in some fashion. We heard that from government officials today. There are going to be some discussions about what fair compensation would look like, but the Canadian government has insisted at the end of the day, it will be fair. Another big part of this, and this may not be the most exciting phrase you'll hear all day, but it's really important to the deal, is the dispute resolution mechanism. So essentially what we're talking about is when Canada and the U.S. have a trade dispute, how do they work that out? Well, right now, under NAFTA, as it stands, they send it to an expert panel. The U.S. doesn't like that. It doesn't think it's fair. Canada had said, listen, we need that. You guys are a lot bigger than us. We need a fair way to work this out. Ultimately, Canada got its way. You may hear this referred to as Chapter 19. That is going to remain in place. So that is certainly a win for Canada. But another big issue that is not nearly as clear a win for Canada has to do with tariffs. Donald Trump's favorite sledgehammer. Certainly you have heard him threatening the Canadian economy with the prospect of auto tariffs. That would be, uh, some people have called it car Mageddon. It would have been a terrible situation for Canada's economy given how big the auto sector is. Part of this deal means that Canada would be exempt from any auto tariffs, but in order to get that, Canada had to agree to a ceiling on how many autos and auto parts it produces. Now, experts suggest that this is well above what Canada is producing right now and will for the foreseeable future, so it shouldn't be such a big issue for Canada. But the other half of the, the tariff puzzle has to do with those aluminum and steel tariffs that are in place right now. There is nothing in this deal that alleviates those. Canada has estimated $16.6 billion worth of tariffs that have been slapped on the Canadian economy, and the government says it's just going to have to keep working to resolve that. That is not part of this deal. So, Catherine, is it fair to call this the win-win-win the Prime Minister has always said he insists on? Well, certainly when we heard from the Prime Minister and the Foreign Affairs Minister today, they are insisting that they got what was in everybody's best interest, that this is the modernized deal that they set out to achieve. The opposition parties, though, not nearly as convinced, saying that Canada seems to have given up a lot and asking some questions about what we really got in return. Let's listen. This is a good deal for Canada. It provides certainty and security as we move forward. We have ensured continued access to the North American market in a time of uh, protectionism. He's back down to Donald Trump on dairy. He's back down to Donald Trump on auto quotas. And he's back down to Donald Trump on pharmaceuticals, meaning Canadian patients will have to pay higher for drug costs. Now, after making all these concessions, we'd like to know, did he secure an end to the softwood lumber tariffs? 
want to pick up on a couple things Andrew Shear said right there. He also mentioned the pharmaceutical sector, and he is right that there is a specific class of pharmaceuticals where under the intellectual property rules, it's going to be a couple more years before generic drug makers can try to make uh, their own versions of these specific kinds of drugs. So there are some instances where it's true, Canadian consumers will be paying more for pharmaceuticals. As for his point about whether Canada got something good in return, like a deal on softwood lumber. Uh, it's perhaps a bit unfortunate for Mr. Shear that just as he was saying that, the BC Lumber Trade Council issued a release saying, it's pretty happy with this deal. It's glad that dispute re resolution mechanism is still in there. And yes, it wants a re resolution to softwood lumber, but of course, that is not specifically a part of NAFTA. That doesn't mean, though, that the opposition parties are not going to continue to hammer this. The NDP going even further, saying that the government completely caved in to Donald Trump, particularly around supply management. And this is not nearly over yet. Uh, the Prime Minister himself pointing out that this is just another step in the process. All three countries have to ratify this deal. Their various political bodies have to sign off on it. And we heard from um, the Prime Minister today, but also from Donald Trump, saying that that is not a given. Uh, it is certainly going to take some time, so there will be plenty more for trade fanatics uh, to watch <laughs> and obsess over. Much more to come, Catherine. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're that welcome. is the CBC's Catherine Cullen in our Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. Turn our attention now to the weather. As you can see, Carolyn doing double duty. Anthony is off, not off this week. He's on another assignment. So oh you'll be my sidekick. Yes. Or I'll be yours. <laughs> we'll be each other's. Okay. <laughs> so before we get to the weather, though, we have this amazing video to show you. Just have a look at this. Yeah, it's not every day you see a, wait for it, wow. massive tuna. <laughs> jump out of the water. Several hundred pounds <laughs> for sure and that's photographer Ronald O'Toole who caught that on video near the station diner in Holyrood this past weekend. Yeah he says he uh, this time he really got lucky uh, being in the right place right at the right time. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Great video. <laughs> All right. So the weather, you know, we're in October now. I know. And it Welcome was a, to October. <laughs> it was a lovely day in our area today. It was, yeah. And some nice weather. It's very quiet, actually, weather-wise. Uh, not a whole lot on the go. Let's uh, start by having a look. Today got up to 11 degrees in St. John's. You can see temperatures on the island, not too bad. Deer Lake got up to 12 degrees, much cooler in Labrador. Churchill Falls got up to uh, three degrees today, and it's a cool, cool night coming for that neck of the woods for sure. Here's a look at your satellite radar. We do uh, have some showers affecting the west coast and moving eastward overnight tonight, but it should be ending fairly early. This is uh, those little band of showers uh, pushing on through overnight, but uh, we do have some uh, flurries for parts of Labrador, a chance of some flurries there or some showers for Happy Valley Goose Bay overnight tonight. But overall, you can see it's looking pretty clear on uh, the island. Just a few spits of showers uh, there on the West Coast. So overnight lows on the island uh, between three degrees and six degrees. So it's a cooler night. Lab City, though, is really chilly. And tomorrow morning, if you're in Lab City, when you wake up, the wind chill is going to be minus 12. So it's going to be a very, very chilly, chilly uh, morning. But the winds are pretty light, uh, so very clear. And things are going to be staying clear again tomorrow. Not much happening. <laughs> you can see what I mean by a quiet weather-wise. A bit of afternoon cloud cover for the Avalon Peninsula, but as for the rest of the province, things are looking pretty clear throughout the day uh, tomorrow. So lots of sunshine to enjoy for the east and for everywhere. Temperatures uh, getting up to 12 degrees in St. John. So tomorrow is going to be very similar uh, to today. Lots of sunshine. And, and decently warm temperatures. 11 degrees as the high for most of central with lots of sunshine there as well. A little bit of afternoon cloud moving in uh, for the west coast of uh, the province, but light northwesterly winds just getting up to 10 kilometers an hour. So yeah, it's very quiet. Nice. I like it. Up along the straits, a little bit cooler there, but lots of sunshine. Temperatures around the 7 or 8 degree mark for the rest of Labrador. Staying pretty chilly in Lab City throughout the day tomorrow and some afternoon cloud moving in. Uh, temperatures in Happy Valley Goose Bay looking quite nice. So things are going to stay fairly quiet for the next couple of days, really until we get to Thursday. That's when Labrador is going to start to see some rain. It's going to start to see some wind. And then on Friday, 
it's going to hit the island. So I'll have uh, more details on that a bit later, Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. Kids Eat Smart kicked off with an event at Vanier Elementary in St. John's today. That school meal, meal program offers nearly 30,000 meals a day, all at no cost to students. The program got a boost today thanks to a donation from TD Bank. Here now is Jeremy Eaton swung by the school to learn more and ask what kids really like to eat. Take all the way down to your knees. Clap. Well, we all know that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And when children have a healthy breakfast, they are mentally and physically stronger. They're able to concentrate better. Uh, principals tell us all the time that when kids have a breakfast, they come to school and they're, they're ready. They're ready to learn. And of course, they're more attentive and their concentration levels are there. So breakfast is so important. Eating healthy and also understanding what healthy food is all about. What's your favorite food to eat? Strawberries. Why do you like strawberries so much? Because they're sweet but not too sweet. I like grapes and I don't like pineapple. I like broccoli and I don't like grapes. I love grapes and I don't like peach. Every day we serve over 29,000 meals to school-aged children in Newfoundland and Labrador. It costs a dollar a breakfast. So when you think about that, $25,000 is 25,000 breakfast, and we do that every school day. And every school you're serving over 5 million meals, so support financially is truly uh, uh, important to our program. What's your favorite food? Pizza. <laughs> Why do you like pizza so much? Because it's yummy. I like candy and I don't like vegetables. Whoa, bold. I like candy and I don't like vegetables. Whoa, bolder. I like grapes and I don't like candies. I think eating healthy at school and understanding healthy food, that's so important. But there's many reasons why children come to school hungry. Uh, children don't have breakfast at home because they don't feel like eating first thing. Children have long bus rides. But when they come to school and have a healthy breakfast in an environment where they understand healthy choices, they can take that home with them. I like apples and I don't like onions. I like jello and I don't like peppers. I li like uh, olives and I don't, I don't like mushrooms. I like kiwi and I don't like mushrooms. I like strawberries and I don't like bananas. I like everything because our parents make us try everything, me and my sister, and we just grow to like it. It's a very welcomed um, change made to the system. The province is making changes to how it determines the financial needs of seniors who need long-term care. What do those changes mean? We'll talk about it when we come back.
Big changes are coming to the way government does financial assessments of people needing long-term care and community support services. People will be assessed based on their income and not by how much money they have invested or how much they have in the bank. The new financial assessment process comes into effect November 1st, and according to seniors advocates, it will give clarity to a sometimes confusing situation when people try to calculate their finances when they're looking for government care. Suzanne Brake is the province's seniors advocate. It's a very welcomed um, change made to the system. How so? It will affect uh, seniors and those who are under 65 years old as well who access services through our community support program through the personal care home system and through our long-term care system this change has been advocated for as long as 10 years ago the 50 plus federation for example has had it as a re resolution every year for 10 years there are other seniors organizations and individuals who also believed that this is a change that really needed to happen uh, as well, it, we are the, the one, almost every single province in Canada has an income only um, approach that they use versus income and, fi and uh, assets. There are fixed assets, which would be like your house and your car and your cabin and those kinds of things. And then there are liquid assets. And liquid assets are your savings in your savings account or your checking account and, and annuities or, or RSPs, those kinds of things. So those are liquid assets. But Ms. Gray, there, there was confusion about whether your house could be taken from you and so on. How, how did that play out with family members? Um, I call it an urban myth. I think that uh, there are many, many people here in our province who believe that uh, once a person is uh, going to live in a long-term care facility or, or receiving another service, then their house would be taken from them. That's how they actually put it to me. And uh, then that money would be used for their care. In reality, um, fixed assets aren't taken to, to uh, to pay for care in, in, in long-term care. Uh, but, but if a person chooses to sell their house, then obviously that's a liquid asset. And if you've got $100,000 in your banking account, you'll be assessed you know, likewise. Well, this is going to clarify things because I know there are examples of people who transferred their homes and uh, it didn't turn out well. No, there are times in my previous role, I was the provincial director of adult protection. And I've seen instances where it didn't turn out very well at all. Um, there's been times when there have been very loving, caring, you know, next of kin, daughters, sons, spouses, who took very well care of assets belonging to an individual. And then there are other instances when they didn't, when the, uh, the recipient may have, uh, whoever, you know, the money was transferred to, may have taken that money and bought themselves a house, or may have taken that money and uh, bought a car, or whatever. Personally, they'll take more control now. What, what's the value of that, do you think? Well, I think that uh, as we grow older, uh, well, throughout our whole lifetime, but as we grow older, we certainly respect our, our income and our assets, and we want to control that you know, with, just, with, with as much rigor as we can. In this instance now, with an income-only assessment process, well, the, the process itself is much more simplified, so it's not intrusive. I mean, they're not, you know, the financial assess assistance officer or the social worker or whoever's doing the, the assessment are not asking questions about exactly how much money do you have here and there and everywhere and what else do you have and those kinds of things and then being reassessed every year and, and, and those kinds of things. So control will now sit in the hands of, of seniors and others who access those services. Um, and um, yes, it certainly is a, a much more palatable kind, kind of situation for people to be in. Suzanne Brake, thank you very much. Thank you. Turning now to the Muskrat Falls Inquiry, during today's testimony, former Premier Danny Williams not only defended the decision to push ahead with the Muskrat Falls project, he also lashed out at those who have criticized it. It happened during cross-examination when Williams was asked to respond to people who say he viewed Muskrat Falls as his legacy project and ignored all opposition. Premier Williams wanted this as a legacy project to satisfy his own ego, and it was a going ahead no matter what. 
Who's, so, that, who's that from, Mr. Well, those, we just hear this from different people as, as, as expressing like this the, point. Like the, and I want to put it to you so you can comment on it, because the, the opinion is out there. It's in the community. I'm not it's saying it's a closely out. held opinion by a few critics. But I go no, right but, ahead. But, well, OK, I, I can't quantify the number of people that hold it. But it is, an, it is something out there. We've heard it. And I want to put it to you in sort of the extreme form that I have to give you an opportunity to respond to it. That comment was basically made as recently as this weekend at the symposium. Uh, people with opposed views to, to probably mine for want of a better term. This weekend that uh, Professor Fein, I think, uh, indicated that it was a damn the torpedoes proceed at all cost uh, approach. Well, nothing is further from the truth. I can be quite honest with you, not at all is reckless and irresponsible and shameful to make that statement because it's absolutely untrue. I've stated before that we turned over every stone, we explored every option, both legal and financial and, and, and partnership and otherwise, uh, to, to bring us to the conclusion that we finally came to in 2010 with the sanction in 2012. That, you know, in my legacy, well, what about the legacy? I mean, I, you know, I felt that from 2003 to 2010, I had a good run. Uh, you know, politics is not without its up and downs and its highs and lows, and I was warned about that going in, and I knew it coming out. Uh, but having said that, I mean, at one point we hit a 93% approval rating. I mean, I didn't need a Churchill project to put my stamp on, on, on the province, or, and nor did, I, nor did I care. I went in and did what I wanted to do to the best of my ability in conjunction with the best advice and the best team I could put together, and I did it in the best interest of the people of this province. So for some people, I try to be respectful here, but for some people to come around and try and disparage the project and disparage us and, you know, merely make a fool of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, you know, by, by coming out with this kind of uh, irresponsible uh, showmanship, which we, we can't attribute, I can attribute to only one person, but right now, but there are others, uh, you know, it's terrible. You know, it, it, you, know you, you, don't, you don't see Quebec doing this, right? That's why I'm saying we can learn from the province of Quebec. And, and the people come back. They don't trash their own projects. But you Mr. Know. Williams, just to, just to pick up on that, I mean, we're living in a d democratic society. So you, being a politician in the past, would know that there's people who are going to agree with you and people who are going to disagree with you. So people have a right, I assume, to disagree. And while you may not exactly like the tenor of their statements, I would suspect that. In a democracy, we have to give people the opportunity to, to basically express their views. Absolutely, Mr. Commissioner, and I, and I couldn't agree with you more. But you know, however, when someone attributes a reckless, damn the torpedoes approach to me, which I know is comp the farthest thing from the truth, uh, then I, as a person, have you know a right to take issue with that. Fifty people working here when the plant opens in September 1999. Up next, a look back at the history of DJ Composites, the company at the center of Gander's massive lockout. Yes, ribbon got cut.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We have made calls. We did everything under the sun in order to meet with the Premier. So we had a we had a very good meeting and got the union perspective of what is, I believe, to be 651 days now the lockout. <laughs> A long-awaited meeting was held today between the union representing locked out DJ composite workers and Premier Dwight Ball. The employees have been on the picket line since December of 2016. DJ Composites is a U.S.-based aerospace manufacturing company that's been operating in Gander since 1999. We've dipped into the CBC archives to look at our coverage showing the history of the company. Here's what we found. 250 new jobs for the town of Gander. This it was standing room only in Gander when Premier Tobin and Craig Dobbin from Canadian Helicopters unveiled plans to manufacture parts for the new Cormorant helicopter in Gander. The company is using more than $9 million of the province's money and a lot of its own. It'll make plastic and fiberglass floors and walls. There will be 50 people working here when the plant opens in September 1999. They hope to have 250 people working here after six years. If they meet those numbers, they won't have to pay any money back to the province, and there'll be tax concessions from the province and maybe the town. This is about to become a working, state-of-the-art plant to make parts for aircraft. Mark Billard and Carol Collis put together the tough skin of the helicopters. You get, you're pretty lucky when you get a chance to uh, uh, have a job in your hometown. Not only were there problems in how the money was approved, John Noseworthy says there were problems in how the money was spent. Of the $9.5 million the government invested, he can only account for about $6 million. When we looked at the 9.5 for tooling and equipment, the, the listing that we were provided with for that actually totaled $7.4 million, and the invoices at the time only added up to $6.3 million. The provincial government's involvement with CHC Composites might not be over despite the problems with this current deal. The plant hasn't made money since it opened, but Dobbin says he's looking to expand his Gander operation. And he's asking the provincial government to pump millions more in public money into his company. Striking workers settle in for the long haul. They say working inside the plant was becoming unbearable. We uh, didn't like how we were being treated, so we joined the union. And now they're trying to take what we had before away from us. The plant opened four years ago. Government gave the company nearly $10 million in exchange for 225 jobs. The company never met that goal. Last spring, another million of taxpayers' money was given to the company. This morning, workers on their coffee break were still coming to terms with the bad news. Some have just found out. 100 unionized jobs gone. Another 20 management and non-union jobs also cut. Shirley Mullet and her husband will both be out of work. The company says it didn't lose any major contracts, but its customers have cut back on their orders. It was supposed to be the cornerstone for a new aerospace industry in Gander, but by 2009, CHC had been sold to an American company and more than two-thirds of the Gander workers were laid off. But I think the history of it is that it was obvious from day one that the Canadian Helicopter Corporation, or CHC, had no interest, in it, uh, no interest whatsoever in running that plant in Gander. It was a money-losing venture right from day one. The new owners, DJ Engineering in Augusta, Kansas, a company that has made aircraft parts for Boeing and Lockheed and helicopter parts for Bell. And so I think it's a positive uh, for this new company to come in and uh, take it over. At least at this point in time, they're expressing interest in maintaining the place uh, uh, for the future. Heli One, now DJ Composites, has been rehiring in the last few months. The union says there are about 75 people now back working at the plant. I've been working there for 15 years, and I think what was offered to us, uh, really it's just a joke for this day and age and for the wage that uh, I think that we should be getting uh, in this industry that uh, we're working at. I think uh, it's pretty bad when an American company cannot just give us, I mean, we're not asking for the world, we're just, we just want to make a living and provide for our families. Here's a look at St. John's Harbor, a live shot from the rooms 
in downtown St. John's. Not a bad evening out there. Uh, it looks very nice. It looks very calm and pretty clear. So we'll find out more about the weather. Yes, right after the break. Welcome back once again. Another piece of video to show you before we get to the weather. Just have a look. Some drivers on the Northeast Avalon were caught off guard by this shooting star. Wow, you can really pick it out. It was a meteor and Vince Gibbons caught it on his dash cam while driving on Columbus Drive in St. John's. It's so bright. Isn't it? And much better than the normal dash cam video we yeah. get of speeding <laughs> objects. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this one is very nice. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Wow. And I would assume it broke up before it hit the ground. Uh, I, mean, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> or we'd be on it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And with our eyes still to the skies, uh, the weather is looking really nice. If you enjoyed today, you're going to enjoy tomorrow. Basically, it's going to be a repeat of the same. So we're going to start with a look at current temperatures on the islands. Eight degrees in St. John's Labrador City. If you're there right now, you're in for a chilly, chilly evening and a chilly, chilly morning, uh, dipping down to minus. 12 overnight with that wind chill. So we do have a few uh, flurries and a few showers on the island tonight, but that won't last very long. And then we're looking at clearing skies for the most part, a little bit of cloud cover uh, tomorrow, but mostly tomorrow is sunshine for pretty much everybody. St. John's looking at 12 degrees as the high tomorrow, nice and bright, just like it was today. And the winds pretty light as well, a northwesterly wind gusting to 20. So it'll be a nice crisp fall day, a nice day to go out for a walk. Walk. And uh, the same on the West Coast, a little bit more cloud cover uh, in the afternoon there, but still a really lovely day on the way. And if you're along the coast of uh, Labrador, lots of sunshine there as well. Not a whole lot to talk about with the forecast tomorrow, to tell you the truth. And uh, a southwesterly wind in uh, the West Lab City looking at four degrees as the high with some increasing uh, cloud throughout the day. And you can see this cloud uh, moving in on a Tuesday evening, but still pretty 
quiet, not a whole lot happening in the skies over the island, and we do have uh, some flurries pushing into parts of Labrador, so that could uh, material, materialize as some flurries or some showers uh, for Lab West as we get into uh, Wednesday, and as well some showers moving into the southwest coast of the island on uh, Wednesday evening. But otherwise, it's pretty quiet. We have a uh, mix of sun and cloud mostly for the island in central and in the east temperatures around 9 or 10 degrees and that uh, chance of showers in the afternoon for the west coast on Wednesday and we have a chance of afternoon showers for Labrador as that system starts to uh, move in on Wednesday. So this is where it kind of starts to get a bit messy uh, for Labrador. First we have these showers, this rain moving in and with that is going to come lots of wind. So it's going to be a pretty messy Thursday. The island you can see is staying fairly clear. We do have a chance of showers uh, for the west and for central temperatures in the east 13 degrees on Thursday afternoon. So we have the rain and the wind for Labrador. And as we look into the five day forecast, the extended that system affecting Labrador, well, that's going to hit the island on Friday, but we are looking at a little bit of a boost in temperature 16 degrees there, but those winds are going to ramp up as well on Friday for central areas. Similar storm we're looking at a chilly overnight low minus one there, but Saturday looking like it's going to clear off and as well for Western Labrador, some rain on Friday, some wind and then some clearing on Saturday for now. Some cloud cover for Eastern Labrador and some showers on Saturday and for Western Labrador looking at some cool temperatures for really the entire the five days and a mix of sun and cloud on Friday and some cloudy skies on Saturday. And that's your forecast. Debbie, back to you. Thanks again, Carolyn. Well, an up and coming rapper from St. John's recently found himself in the pages of Rolling Stone, India. Kylie Coyote is the creation of Josh Kylie. After performing at one of Scandinavia's largest music festivals, Kylie was named a top 10 performer. Here now, Stephen Miller caught up with the rapper to find out what's next. Concrete trip, let me rip up your Kodak, hijack my pole rapper, sold that for gold crap. Kylie Coyote. It's a hip hop artist from Newfoundland. Uh, my name is Josh Kylie. I would describe my kind of uh, hip hop music as alternative, uh, even lo fi, even, which is kind of like a minimalistic way to produce beats and actually, you know, give off that old kind of crusty tone to that or aged old school, if you, if you will. So far, um, with Kylie Coyote, I've uh, toured across Newfoundland once and also done a cross Canada tour this past June. Um, I've just recently gotten back from a Swedish trip. Uh, as well for the Live at Heart Music Conference. Well, it all started actually when one of my friends uh, gave me a copy of Enter the 36 Chambers by Wu-Tang Clan. And one of the tracks off of that album was like the very first track that I ever kind of like, you know, sang along to, I guess. And that kind of like really carried over where I was like, man, this, this seems like I could really do this for myself. Like, I really like the emotion and the actual lyricism that's conveyed just by, by speaking over a beat and speaking in time. My team and I are planning a tour uh, very, very soon. I know that that's probably gonna be, you know, uh, somewhere between November. Uh, we're planning on going across Newfoundland uh, just like we did in May and uh, maybe bring some more, uh, some more numbers to the shows and just see, you know, how much of a local crowd I would be able to draw here, kind of win them over and then, then work my way over onto the East Coast and then maybe even Central Canada. Here's a look at our viewer photo of the day. Isn't that a great shot? It capturing is. the wave crashing on the rocks. Beautiful sunset. This was taken yesterday. I'll tell you where after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. So now we get to see our viewer photo of the day and it's a beaut, gorgeous shot. This was taken in beautiful Bonavista, Moses Point. Oh, I've never heard of yeah. Moses Point. But I looked it up and there's a Moses Lane in that area. So that's probably where it gets uh, the name. Mark Gray sent this in and uh, was taken yesterday, the last day of September. He really does take beautiful pictures. You've highlighted them before. Mm -hmm. And I understand that Mark is a teacher in Bonavista. So I'm sure he can share these photos in the classroom with some teachable moments. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mark. And if anyone else out there has a shot, please uh, send it in, email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Thanks for being with us. That's our show for this Monday. Have a great night. Good night.